Your full name again. Claude Richard Hillenbrand. And your date of birth? November the 6th, 1923. And you grew up where? Evansville, Indiana through high school and uh, never went left in the Army and didn't go back. Where'd you go to high school? Central High in Evansville, Indiana. Okay. So right after high school or once you turned 18, you, you uh, joined up? Uh, I was, yeah, I just was 18 when I enlisted in the Air Force. I went up to enlist in the Navy and I wanted to get in the CBs to learn to operate all this equipment. Oh, yeah. Uh, this Navy recruiter said, no, I'll just sign you up and they'll put you where you are. I said, no, I want it. CB he said, I can't sign you up. Just said, you have to go in Navy. I said, just forget it. I walked down the hallway. There was an officer sitting in there. I stepped the door. He said, can I help you? I said, oh, I'll join the Air Force. Sign here. <laughs> so that's how come he'd be in the Air Force. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Where'd you go for for training? I went to Miami Beach for basic training. Mm -hmm. Lived in a petition hotel. We moved civilians out and we moved in. We left there and went to Lincoln, Nebraska for airplane mechanic school. We left there, they picked 42 of us and we went to Seattle, Washington, Boeing Aircraft Factory for flight engineer training. And then from there, we went to Kingman, Arizona to gunnery school. And after that, we assigned combat crews and went to that. We ended, we ended up in taking our phase training as a crew in Powell, Texas. And then we went over, see, we, we went over on the Queen Elizabeth and we was the last, they held it up one we were supposed to sail that night. They held it up to get, we got there and got on. They said we were in bunks, that we were actually 20 feet below the water level. <laughs> so that wasn't a very good idea, but we made it. We were six days going over. We landed at Glasgow, went down to a base. Uh, there was a sign and we ended up then going to the, well, it was the 8th Air Force, 3rd Division, 45th Wing, 452nd Bomb Group, 730th Squadron. And then from there we started flying combat. That was at, uh, out of uh, Deef and Green in, in, in England. Were you with the same crew the whole time? Yes, sir. There was uh, 10 of us signed to go over before we left, uh, before we went overseas and we were there as some of them finished flying early and tra other transfers and that but the uh, pilot and me and most of the other the gunner uh, gunners were all still on the, the same crew and of course when the pilot and me finished uh, we were the only two for the 35 mission the other crew flew 20, uh, 30 to 32 missions and was sent out. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 35 missions. That's. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. We got over. We was only supposed to fly 25. That's what the Memphis Bell was the first crew to fly 25, and they come today. We flew, got there, and then as we got closer to. D day they moved it to 30 and then they come up and said we'll go 35 and then after that then they reached it went right back to 30 I think to 30 then. But the pilot and myself were the only two on our crew that flew 35 um, what what was the uh, the base where were you based in England? At, uh, they called it uh, Deaf and Green Atterbury. It was uh, on the train track at Atterbury. Uh, we were 75 miles north of London, 18 miles south of Norwich. Did you spend any time in London? I went the first pass we had, I went down for one at one time. I wasn't too impressed. We got to see Big Ben and uh, the 
Westminster, all of that in London, but I never did go back. <laughs> Our navigator, he went every time he got down there and come me when and said he was broke, wanted to know he wanted he had a pass, he wanted to go to London. I let him have the money. <laughs> he went down there. Next day he was back at the base. I said, Max, I thought you went to London. He said, I did, but he said one of them buzz bombs went off in the building next to me and I caught the next plane back and train <laughs> back. <laughs> Yeah, I don't blame him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, what were the the names or nicknames of your uh, your bombers that you flew on? Well, Vita Vita Vicky was the first one that was I uh, stand for. I, I, I came, I saw, and conquered. Yeah. It got bombed on that shuttle raid to uh, Russia. What was the name of it? Vidi Vidi Vicky, I think what it was. Oh, okay. If you can understand Latin, that's I yeah. came, I saw, and conquered. Then we flew a whole lot on different ones. The main one we flew quite, we flew on uh, borrowed time and time, and, but mostly at the last we were flying on one called Smoky Liz. And then, of course, we flew the mission of that Colonel's daughter, I, <laughs> or not for sure, Melissa or whatever. And then, uh, Colonel Odom, after the war ended, he lived down here at, uh, out from Chattanooga uh, for the Signal Mountain. Yeah. Of course, he's died since then, but he, he was down there for, I thought about going down to see him. And, and, uh, I know the day we belly landed that plane, I was sitting there, and he come over and said, you flying this, all this? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, well, who's the pilot? <laughs> Lieutenant Graff there. He said, he sure made a good one, didn't he? Because <laughs> yeah. all 10 of us walked away without any injuries. That was, uh, this one here, hold that up. And yes. so you had a belly landing. Yeah. What was the circumstances around that? We coming in to land, been to Munich, we had number two engine knocked out already. And we were coming in to land and we was almost ready to touch down. They give a red light and said, go around the runway block. When the pilot went to par, we lost another engine or maybe two and come in on the belly of it. And as we slid across there on the belly that, uh, that we were there, we, not a one of us got a, uh, the tail gunner went down Skinny's knee a little bit, but outside there. And we, uh, there, and, uh, of course, that's Max Schultz, a navigator, pilot, and I believe that's George Sloganoff, a bombardier. And this Neil next to me is co-pilot. He's one that got transferred to a fighter <laughs> outfit after flying 30 missions. And, of course, me and different ones and that. It, it was... And like I said, it, it was something to fly on a, a plane with a picture of a baby on it, you might say, bombing <laughs> Germany. You know, trying to kill Germany. I guess it would be. Most of them have scantily clad women on them. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the eradicator was in our squadron. It showed a big old mule with a Hitler's head on it. Or no, a big rat with Hitler's head on it. And they called it the Eradicator. <laughs> and then there was some that was the crew taking off one time, going, getting ready to go over. Before they got to the channel, they run to another crew, a plane run into them, and they both went down. And uh, they they called theirs then uh, borrowed time the next plane they got. That. that uh, was a flight engineer and a radio man on them crew, that crew, which we'd been with all through training, was killed then. The radio, the radio man, when they found his body, he had never pulled a ripcord on his parachute. I think he probably hit his head or something. The flight engineer opened his parachute and it circled and caught him between number two engine and the fuselage and killed him. Hmm. I said, that's something else there. But most time, like I say, we 
the crews went down, we we were just in our immediate crew there and that. We we weren't there that long to really get to be real friendly with everybody, you know. Yeah. Um, can you describe again a typical mission? Like what time of the morning would you get up and well, get ready? Well, it depended. Uh, if we're going in like to Berlin, <clears throat> they would come in probably at five or six, call us. Mess was go to mess, and then an hour after mess hall, you went to brief them. Then takeoff was generally an hour, hour and a half after that. I'll say one uh, the, that we as flight crews eat good. They had field stoves, which I, before I went in the Army, I worked for a while at this place building these field stoves. They had them set up in a row, and when you went through the line, you told the cook how many how many eggs you wanted and how you wanted them fixed. Of course, they cooked, and put you on bacon, sausage, and then they had great big drums of all kinds of juices in that. The flight crews uh, enlisted men and the officers eat out of the same kitchen. When you come out of the kitchen, our mess hall was here, then the next over was the officers. Whichever place needed what they were coming out with is where they went. We eat the same as the officers did. And that, so, uh, they filled it once, one morning, we wasn't on a flight, but they brought powdered eggs out. Oh, you, you talk about fussing. <laughs> They didn't ever do that again after that. We got the hard boy, we got the egg fried as they was, you know, cold storage and that. We had a little guy with a ground crew with our crew. He was there one day. We just, they could they wasn't allowed to eat. They ate in a separate mess hall, everything. I told him, I said, Come on, go eat with us. He said, They won't let me. I said, Yeah, they will. Come on. We go start to the child line and this sergeant said, hey, he's not a flight crew. I, yeah, he's on my crew. He's one of our crew. He, he said, well, all right, let him go. But, uh, but it, it was strictly, the, we were strictly fed separate from the others. So after briefing, what did you, get, you do? You got the briefing, and when you left briefing, you went and got your flight gear on. Net. You went and got you to the fire, uh, and got the guns that you were going to have that day. Checked them and done everything and really went through it. And then to carry them to the plane and mounted them. You wasn't supposed to put no live ammunition until you got in the air and there was nobody around. And then we would wait then and when time to line up, we would get to our positions and they would line up at the end of the runway like squadrons and that, and they'd take off two minutes apart. And, that. and then after we got left in the air, you went two minutes and turned, made a turn then. So, uh, but, but then you went and got in your formation, went out, and once you, by the time you was going across the channel, you was above 11,000 feet. We'd be on oxygen. How long would a typical mission last? Uh, eight to ten hours most of the time. Sometimes we'd go up Berlin or up uh, Leipzig up past, and that we'd be 11 to 12 hours. Uh, majority, I say, was around eight to ten hours. That's a long time to be yeah. up there in the cramped space with and, all your uh, gear on. Um, we, they would give us a little box and generally had some kind of candy and stuff in it when we took off. That was to kind of snack on. Of course, <laughs> you, a lot of times you'd open it up and there'd be a note in there say, my name is so-and-so, I live in London, come down, we'll have a good time. Flip. <laughs> 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 but we had, now the, the 15th Air Force, uh, or the one over in the South Pacific, they give them a can of Spam and some bread. And one guy told me he eat so much spam on his flying come down there that he couldn't even stand to see a can of it now. 
How often would you fly? Like every other day or? We. Did it vary? We have flew every day for three or four days. And that hardly ever was over on the ground over four days. So well, unless we was flying again. And that, of course, uh, we didn't go over, you know. It was, it was something there to see. We talked before about uh, you know how cold it would get up in at altitude and um, well, it starts dropping pretty much after you got past ten thousand feet and then twenty to thirty thousand feet it'd be a low uh, forty below zero. You had to wear a, a silk glove on that if you had to take your big gloves off you you, you couldn't touch no metal with your butt any part of your body or it freeze to it. And you had heated suits? Yes, sir. They they come out with, when they first, they had these wool suits. In fact, I had one, the, the collars come up real around here and that. But then they come out with the electric suits. And you would plug, the, put the boots on and plug it into the bottom and then you would, the waist and that and then hook it. And, you plug everything up, and then you had an extension cord. You went into the outlet on the plane, and you could turn that up or down, whichever you need. Did that work okay for you? Yes, it worked good. You like it better? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and what else would you wear? Well, <laughs> we would have them electric suits on, boots and gloves, and that we had a mask, uh, oxygen mask on, and then we had throat mics that would fit around our throat. And we had helmets with the ear where the parts of the radio hooked in and that there. And then you had a metal, if you was in combat, you had a metal, like a metal -like cap or a cat, but it had ears, that big ear pads, and it fit over that so you could hear. You were, uh... You finished up as a technical sergeant? Yes, sir. And uh, uh, what po position did you uh, occupy on the bomber? I was flight engineer. My regular position was top tier. I flew all over, of course. We had one guy, he was wild to fly up there. And we would swap out, let him fly up there, and I'd fly in the waist. Or I flew the waist one time I, or something. I flew in the tail once, I flew in the ball turret once, and I flew in about every position there was on the plane in one mission on that. We had a crew that when we was in training in Texas, we pilot me, we made it our point that we would try to tell to teach each other, other guys, what your part was and Get them to go. If one had to change place and step into your position, he could. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah. If somebody was injured or yeah, or or mm -hmm. killed, yeah, you know, somebody's got to take over a oh, different yeah. spot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What what was it like when you were? Uh, you'd see the enemy fighters or or enemy any aircraft flak. You, <laughs> well, the flak ain't much you could do about it. Just sit there and watch it and hope it didn't hit you. You could hear it hit your plane. And in fact, a uh, waste gunner was there. <laughs> Piece come through the waist and went through and cut the end out of his parachute he had on under his flak suit. Mm -hmm. And I always carried extra parachute and stuff, you know, to have when we need it. And uh, he, they, he was no time at all changing parachutes, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but you just, like I say, and fighters, you would you throw the switches on your gun. You had them switches to go and, or to, to, to top them. And of course, after you took off and was in the air clear where you would see out of there, you charged your gun with live ammunition. Did, did you ever get really scared or? I 
I guess the time we bombed went in for that V2 rocket, I, I, how scared I was, I don't know, but they, they opened up the first shots was right now, and I, there was a plane off to our right, and they started bailing out of it, and this one guy bailed out and opened his parachute as an engine, number two engine exploded, and fire shot back and caught his parachute, and I see them just dropping. I said, that was about the worst of any of it I've seen, uh, that uh -huh. I ever, it ever bothered me much. Uh -huh. Of course, I mean, you was concerned, but you, you didn't let it interfere with what you was to do. What, what, what was the worst mission, or I guess the, yeah, the worst mission that you were on? Was well, it I your last say, one? I, I'd say that was where we bombed them, the V rocket ship. They was right on us on that. Uh, of course, going into Berlin down there, like I said, well, you know they couldn't but half their guns shoot at you, so and that, but, uh, you was always concerned when you turned on the IP point because you made you went flew straight and level right in the same speed till you got to the target, and that's when they would try to take you off or something. We uh, was we was coming off the target at Berlin this one time, and the waste gunner hollered, "Look at three o'clock." I looked over and there was a swarm, like a swarm of bees, of German, that ME-109s, flying past. I could actually see the pilots sitting in, them, in the, their plane. They passed past us and went to the group that hadn't dropped yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to turn, you think about it, well, you ought to might turn and start shooting at him, but then you know that when you did, you was in for a battle then. But that, that, that was the time then. And that, you wondered, like I said, you know, you was talking about the 100. They, one of their, when they tried to show that they were surrendering and then the fighters come in to escort them, they shot them down. And after that, they were, they were the main ones the Germans looked for. <coughs> Describe a little bit your last mission, number 35. Well, it was, you You have a concern because so many on their last mission are shot down. But we were going in to this target and it was, it was just a little bit concerned, you know, you were more, I, I felt like I had more of a chance of being probably shot down that and then not, I wouldn't go back or nothing. And we went into the outskirts of Paris where we bombed. I started out bombing Berlin, ended up bombing the outskirts of Paris. When we were five days out at sea coming back before they ever took Paris. And then, but that that was a little nerve wracking. You 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 sweated that out. I'll say more because you know it was your last meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the. Uh, you remember any funny stories? That <laughs> oh, about the only funny one. I was flying co-pilot and them them guys from the medic up there. They wanted to fly, but once we got in, they were scared to death. <laughs> I've had I've laughed about them more than any of that. <laughs> Tell him I take a hold of that. And boy, he grabbed me. I got up to go hook the supercharger up. <laughs> Reached down, grabbed that parachute, and he latched onto my arm. What's the matter? I said nothing. Where are you going? Why are you carrying that parachute? I said anywhere you go on here you carry. <laughs> Man, I, we laughed about that more than anything. I guess we was foolish. <laughs> he, maybe he had more sense than we did. <laughs> but well, they go along. And I had swore after D-Day, when I seen that bomber explode going down the runway in Germany over there, 
that I wouldn't fly on B-24s. I come out here to Smyrna, and the line chief, I told him I didn't want to fly, so he had uh, a BT-13A, which is a little partially trainer plane, mm -hmm. two-seater with single engine. He said, well, you just take care of that. Well, then about a week later, we, they fly in two, I get two brand new AT-6s. Yeah. And boy, you talk about something hot now, they would. And we, uh, the pilot, uh, they come down and hollered me, get a parachute, you're gonna go with me. And I, I flew with this big captain on them, all of them. And then I flew with this one little guy, he was a major in that BT-13A. We got up about 10,000 feet, he hollered, hey, you got your seat belt buckled? I said, yes, sir. Well, hang on. <laughs> He started barrel rolling, went up in a stall, and here we come down. He done everything he could do with that plane. <laughs> and then the P-50, P-80 uh, sixes, that uh, looks more like a German, uh, Japanese zero. Yeah. Uh, I'd go up with them, man, them things were pretty hot too. Landing gear retract and everything. Yeah, I got to fly in one of those. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we just got him in and took off with this captain. Forgive his name. Great big guy. We no more got off the ground than that. And he said, you got it. And I said, well, they wasn't even, I didn't even have the stick. It was still in there. I hadn't put it in. I had a time getting it. And finally, I hollered. Hey, I didn't have nothing to fly it with. And you hollered. He said, I thought you was a little rough in that. <laughs> He told us, now put it in a stall. Well, we started up, and just as soon as that thing started quivering, I popped it. And he said, you didn't even get it in a stall. You ought to do better than that. But it was a lot of fun flying in there. And I wasn't going to fly B-24, but the line chief kept after me. He said he had so many got the others shipping out that he needed a crew chief. And, flight engineer, so I started flying on them. A lot different when you get in one of B-24 and you start flying and that wings is out there flipping it there. You get on that 17, that's solid. There ain't nothing given there. But I said, well, it took me a little while to get used to the 24, but it was all right. So. And then um, talk about, you're talking about that one hydraulic one now. I know right then it was a 24 because the B-24 was all hydraulics, the B-17 was electric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, it was. Look back now at it, it wasn't. It was all fun. I had a great time. <laughs> Do you remember? Uh, I know there's so many aircraft, but there was one called Channel Express. Uh -huh. Does that sound familiar at all? Not really. Uh, I can't remember for sure which bomb group it was in. That was one of the other guys that I yeah. interviewed uh, last year. He was a pilot. Yeah. And he had a crazy story. They were shot down or hit yeah. by flak. Yeah. Well, the one guy that went on Mike with me on that honor flight. He was a co-pilot on 17s and was shot down on his fifth mission. And that, and that so anyway. That, but, uh, and like I said, uh, the crew that the pilot went down when he just found out he had a, a baby boy, after, uh, what was it, John, in, was it 2000 or 19? 1999, they had a reunion in Nashville, our bomb group. They had a reunion every year or something. And it was out of Opry Land on the. Uh, yeah, it was out of Opry. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, I hadn't seen them. Enough. And uh, the bunch of them got up and went to see the General Jackson turn around in the river up there. And me and him were sitting there talking. He said, Me and Mike said, Well, I only flew six missions, got shot down. I was sick. I said, well, me and my pilot, Lieutenant Graff, flew 35. You know Lieutenant Graff? I said, yeah. He said, we'd been, him and his wife had been trying to find, get a hold of him or nothing. I, 
I had his address, phone number. I give him. I don't know whether they ever got a hold of him. Him and his wife was was at that. And hmm. uh, um, I know I asked you before, but you know, once you uh, got your discharge and came home, you know, where where'd you go work? Well, I. I went to work for a little while out at Vaulty. Uh, they were building city buses there. It's out the airport. I don't know what to call it now. And then I left there and I went to work on the railroad. I was a brakeman on the railroad. Okay. And then they started bringing in diesel and I didn't last too long. And from there I went to driving a truck. I drove a tractor trailer for 32 years. And that's what I retired from. Then I went into remodeling, building this and that, doing kitchens and that. Mike and me built two or three kitchens for people. Well, you're, a very, you're a very handy guy to have around. Well, <laughs> I, at least they, though, it was able to cover up any mistakes I made. <laughs> 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 and then when, after Barbara and Mary started going to Jones Chapel, and, they had this big metal building, and we went in there and made uh, done the sanctuary and classrooms and work right, and everything. Done quite a bit of work at that. So, like Brother Gary, I got a letter in there. He or in an envelope that, where he thanked me for all the work I'd done at the church. And that. But, hey, it was something to do and good. You're you're very involved in church, right? Yes, sir. I have been there more so after I went to Jones Chapel, but before that, I we went to Church New Song in Franklin. Uh, I've done mostly uh, some work with there with that and everything. And then I went started going to Jones Chapel. And I got really involved there. You. Um Earlier, we were talking, and I asked you what advice you ha might have for younger generations. And uh, what was it you were telling me? Well, be proud of your country, and look to be proud of the flag and your oath of allegiance and that. So many of these young people, they. And just like these football players here a while back, refused to stand up and be there for the national anthem. I thought that was the biggest disgrace that they could do. And I don't, since then, I don't care to watch a football game. Uh, you just try to be friends with everybody, love everybody, laugh all you can. Laughter is one of the greatest things you can. That's yeah. all I know. <laughs> huh? I think that. Well, so many of the veterans I've talked to have pointed to, uh, you know, their faith in God. Yes. Um, I'd say the majority will say that. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. you attributed that to... Yeah. You getting through the war, right? Yes, that's for sure. You know, God had His hand in in everything that you uh, yeah. mm -hmm. that's for you sure. making it through. Mm -hmm. Thirty five missions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just like I say, try to be friends with everybody, love everybody, and I've always said laughter and being happy is the best thing to go and give you a year to go and that I have been extra fortunate the family I've got my immediate family my friends at place right in here there's ever none of these people that they always act like they're proud to see you and speak and everything uh, it's it's a joy to be living all those things that's getting pretty much out of hand, I think. 
and that we just pray the Lord will intervene some way. But just try to be happy. Enjoy. A happy person will live longer than a sad person. Someone's worried about everything all the time. That's right. That's all I can say. <laughs> and tell me a little bit more about your family. You have... I have three sons. Me and my first wife had three sons. What are their names? Richard, Mike, and John. Well, Richard's the oldest, and John's in the middle, and Mike's the youngest. Uh, it, <laughs> you get thinking, you think about, well, I must be getting old when your youngest son is <laughs> 68, and, you, and that, and the other two are in their 70s. So, <laughs> and all three of them has, has done great, their jobs and all, and they've all married wonderful girls. And that I, I won't say John is because she's sitting too close. <laughs> but when you got a love for them like that, like the love they show you, you, you know you're not by yourself. Right. You know if you had to pick up the phone and call them, any one of them would be right here. And that's a great feeling. And I, I, I love each one of them. Not only that, you go up here and right up the street here and that, and run into Mike and Okay. They're great people. Other people around in the different subject here are different ones. And that now uh, I know like I said, the one lives up there at four nineteen. I give her some old brother cap, the the old kind caps that her son wanted. And the next thing I know she comes and brings me this cap. <laughs> <laughs> so you you just when you've got people in, in, in this subdivision here, it's some of the greatest people there. They're, they're friends with each other, you know, and that, that's what makes it great. Of course, they may think different about it with me, but to, to them, are they great. Well, you've had a great life, and you're <laughs> surrounded by a great family and yeah. friends. Yeah. What more can you ask for? That's right. They, they, and. I have got involved in the church. I have no fear of death. And time or two here in the last couple of years, I have been at the point of death. I had no fear of death. I put it in the hands of the Lord and he brought me through. I, I went and had a, they run a test on my bladder at the hospital got out of it, come home that night, I started getting chills. John took me to the ER and they took me straight in and started getting, I had a urinary tract staph infection. After it was over and I went to my regular doctor, he looked at it, he said, God said, you, you had that, said, it had got in your blood. He said, you, you was at the point of death, but the good Lord wasn't ready for me. Wow. And that, so, how much happier, better can you be? <laughs> yeah. right. And to have a guy like you come and listen to all my hot air, I think that's great <laughs> too. Uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, well, that's more than hot air. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. It's... Well, I, I appreciate you, Mike, and your Mike's son. Uh, oh, yeah, and I'm glad to meet you him and that. And that thing ever long, but well, thank you again. Thank you for your service and uh, for okay. putting up with uh, two interviews today. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's all right. I just enjoy you and being here. I feel like I'm bragging about things and that. I don't mean to be bragging about it. I'm trying to remember what happened, you know. But. Uh, I appreciate that memory. It's yeah, well, you amaze me. Well, good <laughs> Lord bless me there. I guess I never was too awful bright in school. I just did get <laughs> by, but I made it, so that's what counts. And, well, you're a true inspiration, and I know you just did your job. Yeah, but, but but thank you. 
Uh, well, it, it was a thing to do, you know. That's like uh, this other guy, he was in the Air Force, but he was on C-47s, flew in supplies and that. We were on a Christian broadcast in Franklin there, right up, you know, at John, forget the name of it. And she was talking, to, and she said, he talked about him enlisting, and I talked about, said, well, why in the world did you enlist? We both woke up about the same time, said that was the thing to do, didn't we? That's what we felt like we needed to do.